get started. So very happy to uh, welcome Kevin Munger. Uh, he's the first uh, computational social science professor in the United States. Um, uh, he is a fifth-year PhD candidate in the Department of Politics at NYU and a member of the Social Media and Participation uh, Political Participation Lab, the, otherwise known as the SMAP. SMAP. SMAP Lab. <laughs> um, his dissertation studies the political implications of new forms of communication enabled by the internet and social media, uh, which uh, involves developing innovative methods for performing online behavioral experiments and creating new ways to use text-based data. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. So today I'm presenting the results of an experiment I conducted during the 2016 presidential election. So here's an example of political communication on Twitter. So this particular message is not distinctive in the fact that it's on Twitter. This is the kind of communication that candidates would engage with in, if it were on any other medium of communication. And yet, because it's on Twitter, when Donald Trump tweets something like this, we get responses from people like NSA agent Jim, who doesn't like it very much. And so this kind of response, <laughs> this kind of response engenders further incivility here. So Sean doesn't like NSA agent Jim. And so a average user, a, 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 a not partic particularly active, let's say Trump supporter, who logged on to try to see what was going on with the Trump campaign, in the process of trying to become informed, is exposed to this kind of aggressive partisan incivility. And this person is going to think that, in fact, it sounds like the people on the other side are really quite bad. And con uh, the, the converse is also the case. So this kind of partisan incivility is driving polarization. And so what I'm going to do is, using bots that I control, like Matthew here, send a message to someone engaged in this kind of cross-partisan political incivility. Um, so taking a step back here, what I'm interested in is understanding how norms of behavior online are enforced and how they spread. So I'm going to use bots. So in this case, they are more like sock puppets. They're not behaving autonomously. I'm, I'm controlling them. But they are able to project a partisan identity, so either Democrat or Republican, that they share with the subject. So they're only getting messages from people that they are on the same side of. I can randomize the language the bots are sending. So I'm trying to test if different rhetorical appeals are more effective at changing the behavior of uh, liberals or conservatives. I am specifically interested in if the treated subjects are going to change their behavior by sending fewer of these incivil tweets. And I'm also interested in whether or not this effect is moderated by the subject ideology or subject anonymity, how much information they divulge about themselves on their Twitter account. So to define what I mean by incivility, this is an active question in political science. So Dana Mutt says that following the rules of civility or politeness is a means of demonstrating mutual respect. Uh, these folks say that it has to be above and beyond in politeness. So there's an active debate here. For today, I'm only interested in defining incivility as a personal attack. And so this makes sense if we think about the purpose of the, the message that people are sending. So. We're saying that these messages, these incivil messages, the, the, the goal is to upset or anger the interlocutor, not to discuss or understand a political issue. And, and particularly, I'm interested in cross-partisan incivility. So this is incivility from a Democrat to a Republican or vice versa. Right. So there's a connection between this partisan incivility and another concept that's really important to political scientists these days called effective polarization. So there's various kinds of polarization. We might think of issue polarization as Democrats and Republicans getting farther apart on their ideal tax rate. Affective polarization means Democrats and Republicans increasingly dislike and distrust each other. So they're not going to be charitable when they talk to each other. They don't want to engage in conversations with people. They don't want their children marrying people from the other party. So this quantity has been increasing dramatically in the past 20, 30 years. Um, and I think that this connection between effective polarization and partisan civility helps solve a kind of empirical puzzle. So there, although there's a lot of concern in the general media, a lot of the best studies have failed to find the extreme versions of the echo chamber or filter bubble that people are concerned about, some of the research that's been done here, in fact. And yet, I, there is evidence that the internet use increases um, effective polarization. And so this might be the case if you see this effective polarization 
entailing a lack of respect, which in turn means that incivility is going to happen. So we have cross-partisan communication, which we should expect to have a moderating influence. But if this cross-partisan communication is incivil, it is instead going to polarize people rather than make them more moderate. And that's how you can see a lack of an echo chamber and yet still have increasing polarization. There's also kind of a, why, why, why do we care about this? It seems, though, that there's a revealed geopolitical strategy in terms of how did the Russians use social media in the past election? They didn't promote one candidate or one issue. Rather, they had active, acrimonious debates between fake accounts on both sides. So it seems that they at least think this is bad for American democracy. I think that's why we should care about this concept um, more generally. If we simply ask people how they find the experience of cross-partisan communication online, it turns out they don't like it. So two-thirds of people, when they engage in a communication with someone on social media they disagree with, think they have less in common politically than they did before. So again, we might initially think that cross-partisan communication would have a moderating effect, and in the real world it does, but for a variety of reasons, online it, it does not. And so we're interested in how online communication differs from real-world communication. So I think um, online communication is important so in and of itself, and so that's why we're studying it. So there's a whole literature on com computer-mediated communication, and uh, in, in various ways it differs from real-world communication. The most salient one here is that in the real world, if you're going to do something like say something nasty to someone, it's actually emotionally taxing. To look someone in the eye while you're standing in the same room with them and tell them uh, that they're terrible it involves an emotional cost. And yet these emotional costs are decreased if we are having this communication online. And thus the supply of this aggressive in civil speech is going to increase online as well. Uh, this tendency is compounded by anonymity. So if people are, are able to be anonymous in their communication, they don't have the same kind of reputational consequences or feel of fear of physical harm that they do in real world communication. And so that's a couple of the main way is why online communication is different from, from the real world. There's also been a kind of a path dependency in how norms of speech online have developed. So there's excellent ethnographic evidence about the rise of trolling culture online, and so a small number of committed actors are able to inflict significant emotional costs on other people, and they're able to drive norms of speech towards incivility and uncharitable speech. And so if you engage with one of these people, you're going to think, well, it's hard to control yourself and behave well if there are other people out there who are behaving poorly. So there's evidence of two different kinds of effects of incivility on online discourse. The first is compositional. So it's difficult to actually continue to engage in online communication unless you have a certain tolerance for incivility. And so the people who really want to avoid incivility are going to avoid having political communication on Twitter because uh, you, you can't be sure that you won't be exposed to this. There's evidence that this uh, effect occurs even for politicians and journalists. So these are people whose job it is to engage with their constituents or readers, and yet when politicians are exposed to incivil messages from their constituents, they engage in less of this direct communication with the people that they're supposed to be representing. There's also evidence of direct effects. So if we randomize people to different forums on, and they either get one in which there is evidence of incivil speech or one in which there is not, their behavior changes. And so they adapt to the norm of how civil they should be in a given online setting. So these combination of effects and the presence of these small number of committed bad actors is, is driving political speech and speech in general online towards aggression and incivility. And again, if we simply ask people about their experience with online communication, we see that this is the case. So um, if we look at social media users, the majority of them find that political discussions on social media are less civil, less respectful, and more angry than uh, communication taking place elsewhere. And these effects are larger for people with higher political engagement. So whatever tendencies we're observing are exacerbated in this context of high levels of effective polarization when people are talking about politics in America today. So in order to understand how we might change this behavior, I'm interested in understanding different types of rhetorical appeals that might appeal to people on the left or on the right. And so the motivation for the language I use comes from Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations model, which is based on his moral intuitionist idea. So there's the idea that different types of rhetorical appeals, different types of moralities appeal to people of different ideologies. So specifically, the authority moral foundation, he has found to be more effective at appealing to conservatives. 
And so this language I've used to operationalize this is you shouldn't use language like that. Democrats or Republicans need to behave according to the proper rules of political civility. And so again, we have this um, in partisan cue here, which is the bot is sharing this partisan identity with the subject. The care moral foundation is theorized to be more effective at appealing to liberals. So the message here is you shouldn't use language like that. Democrats need to remember that our opponents are real people with real feelings. In addition to these two moral messages, I have a non-moral message. Uh, remember that everything you post here is public. Everyone can see that you tweeted this. So this is originally intended as a kind of placebo. I'm trying to see if there's an effect above and beyond just tweeting something at someone of these specific moral appeals. I think some of the subject interpreted this as a threat, and so this might have been sort of stronger than the placebo effect. I'm still interested in figuring out what a good placebo in this context would be, but for now, this is just a non-moral message. Uh, in addition to these three treatment conditions, I have a true control group of people who did not get any messages, and so all of the treatment effects are relative to the control group. Yes? In the true control, did they also not get messages from other people? They got this. They got the same number of messages from other people as the people in the treatment groups did, right? So um, the specific hypotheses, so in general, the first one is that this will work, that people who are treated are going to change their behavior more than people who are not treated. I find evidence that that's the case. Um, and all of these are pre-registered on EGAP. You're welcome to look it up. Uh, the other hypothesis is that the different moral appeals would work as I expected, that the care condition would be more effective on liberals and, and the... Um, authority condition more effective on conservatives. So I do not find evidence uh, in favor of this. In fact, the point estimate is in the opposite direction. So we'll talk about why we might think that is. I also theorize that there's going to be an effect of this public non-moral condition, but it's going to be smaller than the other ones. Uh, also don't find evidence of this. It's, sort of, it's in the right direction and it's almost significant, but it's not at conventional levels. Uh, I'm also interested in subject anonymity. So uh, how much information people divulge, people who are fully anonymous, I theorize are going to be less likely to change their behavior in response to the sanctioning. They're less invested in their online identities. And I find evidence that this is the case. All right. So, oh, sorry. I wonder why you thought the care condition would be, bet, would be more, but you thought the authority condition wouldn't work at all. On, on the, on the, this, this stems from um, the reading of Haidt's theory, which is that conservatives generally understand all of the moral foundations, whereas uh, leftists in the West only really focus on two of them, one of which is care. So that, that's why I theorized that. But yeah. So uh, this is building on work that I've been doing for a while, which is developing these online behavioral experiments. And so in a lot of contexts in which traditionally we've done lab experiments, and we have learned a lot from those lab experiments, but they all suffer from a uh, number of, of drawbacks that we all know about live experiments. So they're, they're done with convenient samples usually. Uh, they're done in a short time frame. So we have the treatment and the measurement of the effect in roughly the same sitting. And it's also you know, in the lab, so it's, it's highly artificial. Everyone knows that they are in an experiment. So my approach doing these field experiments on Twitter, I claim, improves on all of these dimensions. So I'm able to find the relevant targeted sample population of interest, which would otherwise be quite difficult. I'm able to measure treatment effects in a continuous and unbounded time frame. And I'll, I'll talk about why that's important, because we actually see that the effects in the first day after treatment and the effects in the first week are sometimes different. And it's also in the same context as the relevant political behavior. So this is a situation in which the subjects are unaware that they're actually taking place in an experiment. So I'm, I'm just tweeting at them and seeing how their behavior changes. I'm aware of this is sort of different from how a lot of academics do research in terms of informed consent and debriefing, and I'm happy to talk about that if, if y'all are interested. So uh, today's experiment, I'm going to build on findings from a previous field experiment I conducted. In this case, I was interested in decreasing racist harassment. So I find a sample of white men, or they were fully anonymous, who were harassing other people using an anti-black racist slur. Uh, and in this case, what I varied about my sanctioning was the identity of the accounts I was using. So I have uh, white men and I have black men, and they're identical except for their skin color and their, their names. The message in this case was, hey man, just remember that there are real people whose feelings are hurt when you use that kind of language. Were they actually animated pictures like that? They are exactly these pictures, yes, that's right. So this gives me maximum control over their identical except for their skin color. Uh, I found that a white high-status bot 
actually did have the expected effect of causing subjects to send fewer racial slurs. And what I mean by high status here is for half of the accounts, I purchased them 500 Twitter followers. So this is a proxy for status in these online settings. And the low status accounts only had about 10 followers. So all of the low status accounts didn't have any effect at all. And it was only the combination of being in group and high status that actually caused people to change their behavior. And in fact, there was evidence of reactants in, in this subcategory, that the black low status bots actually caused the subjects in that condition to send more racial slurs. So that's a, a risk in doing these kind of experiments and really understanding how status and identity work online. That is what I'm concluding from the first experiment and what I'm building on is that social identity and status affect how behavioral norms are enforced in an online setting. So I'm now holding status and social identity constant. So they're all high status bots in the current experiment and they're all doing in-group sanctioning. In this case, the group is partisan, not race. So how did I actually sample these people? I'm interested in a approach that is fast. So I want to be able to send a sanctioning message within eight hours of when the uh, uh, initial message was sent, and I want it to be accurate. Um, so this means I'm trading off on recall, and I will say that this is not a representative sample of Twitter users, of people, of even political incivility, but I think that's kind of a really tough question, and this is, though, precisely the sample that's most interesting. And, but we should consider the implications for external validity when we're evaluating the results. So I'm specifically interested in real users. So these are not elites. These are people who are not verified. They're not journalists. They're not political actors. They're real users, as far as you can tell from a quick inspection. They're being incivil to an outpartisan, and it's about politics. And so in order to find this, this population, I use the following sampling technique. Sean here is not an elite user. He's a normal user. He's tweeting at someone from the other side, so it's cross-partisan, and it's about politics. So Sean is the subject of my experiment. NSA agent Jim is not. So he's tweeting at an elite. And so he is not actually engaging in the behavior of interest for uh, the current study. So I, I kind of codified the method I used for this sampling technique. So I begin by uh, accessing the streaming Twitter API for tweets that contain the handle for either Trump or Clinton. And this is done in October 2016, so just before the election. So just for example, if we had 100 tweets at the beginning that I found that contained these two keywords, I then make sure that the tweet is directed at someone who's not Trump or Clinton, and we're down to about 60 people. I then apply a machine learning model that I'll talk about in a second to calculate the aggression score. I make sure that the tweet is in the top 10% most aggressive. Um, just so we think this is, has a high likelihood of being incivil, so we're down to six tweets. I then manually inspect the interaction, so I make sure that the potential subject is, appears to be an adult speaking English, with a Twitter account at least two months old. And so the second condition was, was quite relevant. Many of the subjects who I found at this point had Twitter accounts that were less than two months old. And so these are people who were, immediately upon joining Twitter, were engaging in hateful communications about politics with strangers. So I think it's likely that this is not their first Twitter account. They specifically created this for the purpose of sowing discord and were not you know, good faith actors in any sense. So that's why I'm excluding them from the study, I think I would not have an effect to change the behavior. But again, we have to think about the sampling technique in terms of external validity. I then also made sure that the incivility is directed at a non-elite from the other side. So it's cross-partisan. So at this point, we're down from the initial 100 tweets to about two tweets. And these are people who I put in the experiment. Yes. How do you know that the two tweets you got out at the end are not just Russian bots? So it's certainly possible, right, that there are some Russian bots in here. So I think a lot of the accounts that I filter out at this point are uh, sort of Russian bots, potentially. Um, if they're, they're, so they're probably not true bots. There might be trolls, people who are impersonating <laughs> other people. But I do think that if that's the case, that would certainly mitigate against finding treatment effects. So these people are less likely to change their behavior. And so I think the fact that I do find some treatment effects means that there, there weren't too many of them, uh, is, is what I hope. They did not. So they did just recently send out messages to everyone who had engaged with these Russian bots, and there were about three quarters of a million people. So that's a lot, but it's also not a, ma it's not, you know, a massive number. And also, those Russian bots should be distributed across all the different treatment conditions. Did your so. bots get any of those messages? I haven't checked, okay. but I, I, don't, I don't think so. I should have gotten an email, but that, that would be very interesting, yeah. Yeah, 
I didn't even think about that. Um, right, so at this point, I'm assigning people to one of the four treatment conditions, and I'm balancing on subject an anonymity, which I think is the most important covariate here. So you're manually reviewing the ones that then are in the sample at this point? Yeah, so at, at, th at that point, after I do the, um, the modeling, I do the manual reviewing myself, yes. <clears throat> Two percent, the right number to think of instability. Four percent, six percent. What what should we think of as the kind of baseline instability that's happening in this in this data set? So the subjects are all people who, first of all, were above this quite restrictive threshold in terms of the classification of instability. Yeah. So I think at that point we're pretty sure that all all of the tweets at this point are incivil. Um, and so at this point, the manual filtering is to make sure that it's in civil by a real person, as far as I can tell, and directed at someone from the other side. So I, I am, I mean, so the model does have errors, and I'll, I'll talk about the model. And, and this is just an example. So what can you give us roughly, um, you know, if you looked at it exposed, what percentage of the tweets that were in the Twitter stream for at, uh, at real Donald Trump, oh. at, at Hillary Clinton were in civil? What, what kind of percentage of the conversation was, by your definition, somewhere in the incivil range to understand how big this problem was. Right. OK. Uh, so I don't actually have, I certainly only have it at that point here. Yeah. Um, so I, I use the cutoff. It's a, based on the empirical distribution of the outputs of this model, yeah. I put the, the threshold for classifying something as uncivil at 25%. Yeah. So and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the results for that. So I would, I would say somewhere around that range, so about a quarter. All right. I think that's right, yes. And so not all of them, though, are directed at the other side. Sometimes there are people, like, Repub Republicans is commiserating, being like, oh, aren't these Democrats so stupid, right? So that's, yeah. So but that's not a direct attack, but, right. Okay, so here's what the bots look like. Um, this is what happens when you click on, if you get the tweet from a bot, you're going to look at who it is, and this is what you see. So this is obviously a Democrat-leaning bot, so this is uh, Neil, and uh, there's certain things about Neil I want to point out. First, we have the, the Hillary logo in the bottom right corner, in addition to the giant Hillary logo at the top. Um, the bio field simply says Hillary 2016. Uh, so Neil is quite old by the standards of these Twitter accounts, and that adds to the verisimilitude and the I've also had Neil send a bunch of innocuous tweets before I do any of the uh, treatments, so that increases the realism as well. And again, so he's got about 1,000 followers, so this makes him reasonably high status. And th these are the sort of things that people would look at when they look at an uh, account that tweeted at them. Yes? Do you have any sort of methodology for establishing these sort of track record, these innocuous tweets? Do you have, how do you decide, like, to... I did not. I, I just clicked. So when you join Twitter, you automatically follow 40 people, and they're uh, meant to be kind of a broad, innocuous set of people. And so I just retweeted those. You and writing original tweets. I did. I did write, you know, maybe 25 original tweets and interspersed them as well. But they were also just like, I really need coffee, for example. So as as inane as I could imagine. <laughs> um, so this is the left-leaning bot. Here is a right-leaning bot. Uh, this is Todd. It's sort of the analogous to the other one. The, the difference here is that Todd is Republican, and this Neil is uh, Hillary. So I actually have two bots for each of these um, sides. There's a, a party and a candidate bot. I had initially thought there might be some difference because the Republican candidate was kind of an outsider from the party, so there might be some difference between how some people reacted to a pro-Trump bot versus a pro-Republican bot. I didn't actually find any difference between the candidate and the party bot, so I'm going to combine the results for the rest of, of today. So just to, to revisit this exact um, process, Matthew is a Republican bot applying the care treatment. So Sean is I've identified as a Republican. And it's important to note that I'm only saying he's a Republican based on the fact that he's being incivil to someone who looks like a Democrat. Right? So that's, that's how I'm assigning these party labels at this point, and so uh, he was randomly assigned to this treatment condition. Republicans need to remember that our opponents are real people with real feelings, and that's how this, this overall uh, works. So getting to the model, as how do I actually measure instability in this context? So I, I use a neural network model 
that was trained to evaluate aggressiveness in Wikipedia edit comments um, by some folks at Wikimedia and, and Jigsaw. So they have a really nice set of over 100,000 human labeled comments that are uh, evaluating whether or not a edit comment on the Wikipedia edit page is aggressive. Apparently this is a big problem, I can't imagine, but it really is. So they've trained this model to evaluate this. Now, the reason I'm using this model in this context is, well, first, that I pre-registered that I would do so. And so I think it's very important to, if you're using text as an outcome in an experiment like this, pre-register not just the hypotheses, but the actual measurement they're going to be using. Text is very high dimensional, and so it's very easy to fit the model that you want to to find the results that you want. So that's why i have uh, using this model. It also maps very closely onto my conception of incivility here. So the personal attacks in the Wikipedia context, these messages are roughly as long as a tweet, maybe a bit longer. And that's what they're trying to evaluate, personal attacks, and that's how I've defined incivility. So I think the conceptual mapping is quite nice. I did also a little bit of ex post validation to make sure that the results aren't crazy. I did some uh, mechanical Turk coding of subject tweets, and overall the, the model did reasonably well on my validation set. I have results for that if you're interested. So you literally used the exact model with all the parameter settings that yes. after it was trained on Wikipedia? Yes, gotcha. that's right. I, I, I think they do. Oh, they do? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, so it's also, the model is an n-gram model, uh, so it's, it doesn't have to have the exact same tokens as the, the model, uh, as the Twitter corpus. Um, so it, it hopefully would be able to generalize from you know, part of that string. Uh, so specifically for modeling purposes, I, I take the, each, each tweet, each subject tweet, and I, I binarize it so it's going to be in, uncivil if the aggression score is above the 75th percentile. Uh, this is the cutoff they use in their model, so they also do the same thing to, to binarize it. Um, I can also, if I want to be a bit more conservative and, and set it to the 90th percentile, and uh, the results are roughly the same. So. Um, this allows me to have as the data here, so these are um, over-dispersed count data. It's the number of uncivil tweets an individual user is sending, and so I'm using a negative binomial model. I have OLS, if you'd like to see the results as well. So the, there's a couple of these graphs, and I want to explain how these graphs work. So the 100% bar at the middle here means there's no treatment effects. And the way we should interpret the y-axis is the individual level change in how many incivil tweets per day people are sending. And so this is relative to the change in the control condition. So it's kind of a diff and diff approach. So this allows me to difference out any kind of um, events that are going on in the real world that might change how people are talking about politics. So it's an individual level difference. So for example, this is pooled across all of the subjects. So this is all three of the treatment conditions pooled. And uh, this is in the first day after treatment. So the first 24 hours after the subjects get my treatment message. The point estimate here says that on average, the treated subjects sent 70% as many uncivil tweets as the control subjects did. Um, we have the 95% error bars here, so it's statistically significant for this time period. Uh, I can now look at different time periods. So here is... The raw number, are they doing less tweets or doing less uncivil tweets? So this is just the number of uncivil tweets. I have run the model with um, looking at the number of civil tweets they send, and there are no significant effects, although the point estimates are negative, so it's a bit of both. Um, but there is definitely a, a change in, in civil tweeting above and beyond the change in so they're tweeting. Sending a few, they're sending fewer tweets, and they're also sending less uh, uncivil tweets. That's right. Um, I, I also do think, though, that sort of substantively, I'm interested in, I, I would be okay if all of the results were from sending fewer tweets overall, because I think there are plenty of tweets in the world, and it's not a big worry that if there are fewer of them, we just want to decrease the... Yes, that's right. Um, so in the first week after treatment, and these are non-overlapping time periods, so this is days two to seven, we see essentially the same effect overall. And yet we can see later on how the effect decays. So in week two, uh, the effect gets closer to zero, and in weeks three and four, the effect becomes very close to zero. So this approach allows me to measure both initial and persistent treatment effects. How many uncivil tweets are these 
people sending per day on average? So uh, averages are kind of. Uh, so I have a table in the appendix. I think it's something around the median was oh man, 50 in a three-month time period pre-treatment. So that, that's the median, and there's definitely a lot of variation because some people tweet very often. One a day. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah something about one a day. Um, but yeah, uh, yes. I'll look at the results. I can, I can look at that again. That might be not quite right. That's right. And how are you making those decisions? How are you randomizing them? I just did it in order. So I, I, I first, you know, every, 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 I, I, I blocked to make sure that the anonymity was roughly the same, and otherwise I just went down. So I would encounter someone and then. Treatment, treatment. Yeah. Control, whatever. And then uh, you mentioned that a lot of this was being done in October of 2016. Yes. So does a three to four week period cross over the election for some, for some users? Uh, so. Obviously, there's going to be a, a large difference in how people are tweeting pre and post election. That's right. Um, it does. Yes. So I think that that is um, an interesting point. So we do have the you know the random assignment. So it, there should be that should be differenced out. But I haven't actually looked at specifically if some people tweet more. I do know that the overall rate of sending uncivil tweets was about twice as high post treatment compared to pre treatment. But I haven't looked at specifically post election versus pre election. I, I suspect that that's the reason why. Yes? Um, so I don't know if it's possible to test, but um, did you look at all at the proportion of cases over time, like the Twitter handles that you thought were anonymous? So my question is more around, like, could it be that people substituted their existing account with an anonymous account? They're like, oh, people are watching me, so maybe I should be anonymous, and therefore I act badly um, through this anonymous account. Right, it could be another explanation. I think that's certainly possible that there's this kind of substitution effect. I don't, yeah, so I, I, I don't think that the, the, this treatment would have been large enough for me to pick up on that particular kind of, like there'd be more anonymous, because there, there were very many of them and they we're talking thousands of them. So I, I didn't notice that, but I think that's at least possible. All right, so um, now we're going to look at the results disaggregated by the type of treatment. So here we're pooling the moral or partisan treatment, so these are the ones that have both the partisan cue and the moral message. And we see that these are the ones that are actually significantly changing people's behavior. Um, however, in this one week time period, the difference in these coefficients is not statistically significant. So that's the way I'm testing my hypothesis here. Um, and yet for the overall pooled results, we see that the results for the first day and the first week are roughly the same. But now we're going to look at the all of the different messages disaggregated. So here we're seeing that of the two moral treatments on the entire um, subject pool, it is the care treatment that is having the um, statistically significant effect. However, again, there, there, there's no difference in these coefficients if we do a t-test. So that's not supporting my hypothesis. So the other parts of what I expected to find were based on subject ideology and subject anonymity. So we're going to look at the anonymity first. This is the non-anonymous sample. These are people who divulged um, their full name, or at least a full name, and what looked like a, a picture of themselves. And so these are people who look like they were invested in an online persona. And these are the people whose behavior changes the most, and especially in the first day. So for the two moral conditions here, there's a really dramatic difference between the moral and the public condition in the first day after treatment here among this subsample. And uh, it seems like these people really change their behavior. And in the first week, actually, all three of the treatment conditions are significant. Were you getting replies to the bot? There were replies to the bot, yes. <coughs> the, bot, the, bot would stay no the, bot, the bot would not continue to engage. Any engage? Yeah, um, that's right. So, th so I think some of the difference between the first day and the first week are, are having that replies to the bot. But there weren't that many of them overall. About a third of the message, treatment messages were replied to, and um, about a third of those were in civil. Yes? So the public condition is what you're referring to as the placebo before? Yes. Yes, that's right. And it seems that there's never a significant difference between that condition and the treatments designed to enforce civility. Is that correct? In any of the slides you've shown? I think that's right. There actually, it's possible that right here there is a difference. I haven't actually run all of these t-tests. But at this point, there's a lot of different comparisons, so I wouldn't. 
they're, they're I was checking. There's two kind of controls you can think about. One is this 100% baseline. The other is the public condition where the warning just said, be careful what you're posting here is public. Right. And I was just checking whether there's any difference to that condition. It doesn't seem to be. Um, so I'm wondering <laughs> if it's just interacting with somebody has the effect um, perhaps because they get a push notification when they're interacted with. Mm -hmm. um, but the message itself, maybe there's not as evidence that the message itself has an effect. I would say that is the, the, from the combination of this study and the previous study that I've done, where in the first study I found strong differences in how people behaved based on the identity of the bot, and here do not really find strong differences based on the message, that I think that social identity and status are more important in uh, affecting how people behave online than our like, specific rhetorical appeals. I would conclude that. Just saying something at all. And saying something at all. You have to begin, you have to, you have to express that this is bad, which I think all of these are doing. But You but, chose to, to do this manually, and that led to obviously high precision in who you were targeting, but also led to relatively low end uh, yes. values here. And what went into that decision not to automate the process? Mm -hmm. And should you have automated the process, just seeing how your data was flowing out, what kind of error rate would you have got, and what kind of precision problems would you have had? And especially, I'm assuming, I would add to that, that I assume that this is these are slightly lower estimates than you would get, because the time thing would be huge, right? So you're actually hitting people up to eight hours after they've, they've tweeted. Which is, if, and if someone gets, you get a, they may be offline, they may not see it, mm -hmm. you know, versus if, if it came within like a minute and they were online and saw it and they, they may have felt more shame or guilt or whatever. So I would like to automate it. I, I think it would have been good to have done so. The NYU IRB did not want me to. So I, I probably could have, I mean, I, I would like to explore doing that in the future, but that was a pretty big roadblock at that point. And um, based on the results of the sort of flowchart of how well I was doing, I think the precision problems would have been without that manual inspection, specifically to see, especially if the account looks sort of real or not, like non-trivial. So it, it, I went from six to two based on the manual inspection. So yeah. we could think that up to two thirds of them would have been incorrect. Now I think. You guys just discarded those. So that would have been that would have been a bot. You're bot hitting a bot, and then you could have ex post dropped those out. I think I think that's probably right, but still, that I mean, there still would have had to have been manual inspection at some point. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think you could have done manual inspection after the election. I, yeah, that's right. I could have. Um, yes, if I had more resources, I would definitely do it that way. And the, the RFP was okay with you doing manually uh, targeting people. They were not okay with you automatically targeting people. Yes. So they didn't want to have this kind of out of control bot scenario. They they were concerned. Okay with Stockpup is not okay with bots. Yes. Yes. Um, right. Uh, yes. So for the sock puppet accounts, did you delete these tweets after you made them? Because if somebody just checked the tweet history of those guys, then they see that they're acting strangely, saying the same thing. Oh, right. So that, over to different accounts. No, that's right. That's right. And so I think uh, a big lesson I've had from these two experiments is how I was surprised at how well they worked. Um, because if you were interested and savvy, you could easily figure out these were bots. And overall, for across the two experiments, about 1% of people responded and said, you're a bot, I don't care about you, something along these lines. Um, so some people did, and I think it would not be hard to do that, to figure out that they were bots. Um, I mean, I did tweet things in between to make it slightly harder. And the, the default way you look at someone's page, you just look at tweets, not tweets and replies. So you have to go click and then click to actually find this out. But if you do that and you care, you can find out within 60 seconds it's a bot, for sure. Um, but I do. You did not delete any of the tweets. I did not. I did make the accounts private after, you know, just after the experiment ended so that to preserve subject privacy. So otherwise, anyone who found the bots, um, and for example, the first paper came out and they got written up a little bit, and then some journalists tried to find the bots, and then they were like, oh, it's, it's private. Otherwise, they could have found all the subjects, and that would have been very bad. Yes? I, so I think, I think it would have been very different. And I think that specifically the results from the first experiment in which the race of the account seems to matter quite a bit. Like how do right. you disentangle these? Or how, can you 
I guess you can't in this situation. Well, so in, in right, so I think if if everyone knew that they were bots, the race of the account shouldn't matter at all, right? And yet it did. So I, I think that means that the mechanism here is the social identity, and that's that's what I think is happening, and people are credulous at this point. Now, it's possible also that people are becoming less credulous as this narrative around bots and Russian interference becomes more salient, but at least at this point, they seem to take it at face value. Right. So uh, moving from the non-anonymous subjects, um, the people who are partially anonymous, who put some amount of information in their bio, the effects are, are smaller. And then the um, fully anonymous subjects here, we see no reductions. And in fact, um, the point estimates are positive for, for some of these and actually quite large for the authority condition. So I think the fully anonymous subjects are the ones who are more likely to be trolls who are going online specifically to uh, you know, cause emotional harm and disrupt communication. And so when I have a bot tell them, hey, you're breaking the rules of civility, I think they responded by saying, well, finally, someone appreciates all my hard work. And so they, <laughs> they kept at it. So this is a, a real important um, inference in terms of understanding who these people are if we're going to do these kind of targeted interventions. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's certainly possible. Um, right, so I'm also interested in subject ideology, right? And so here are the effects on the Republican subjects. We see that the effects in the first day seem to be quite a bit larger. Um, and yet in the first week, this is essentially the same as in the overall subject population. So I'm going to switch to Democrats and look how these first two time periods shift. So for the Democrats, in the week one time period, it's identical, essentially, to how the Republicans are responding. And so this is not what I expected to find at all. I expected for the Democrats, this, this ordering is correct for the Democrats, that the care effect would be more effective than the authority and more effective than the public. These differences are not significant. However, that's the opposite of what I expected to find for the Republicans. And so here we have the, core, the care effect being, the care treatment being most effective when I expected it to have no effect. All right. And uh, yet, I think I, I do want to draw out this difference in the first day also. So if we were doing an experiment in a lab and we were only looking at the immediate response, we would conclude that the effect of the uh, treatment was most effective on Republicans and didn't actually have an effect on Democrats at all. And yet, uh, in, the, in the week after, the effect is identical. And so that's why it's really important if we're doing these behavioral interventions to look at effect persistence and decay. Right. So one reason why, um, sort of one interesting fact about this Democratic sample is that probably not all of them were Democrats. Right. So here, I, again, I was just labeling them based on if they were anti-Trump or anti-Clinton. So these are Democrats and Republicans and how I've been talking thus far. Here are the results if I plot their ideology, if I estimate their ideology based on their Twitter network. So this is the Barbara method of inferring people's ideal points based on who they follow on Twitter. And we see that the subjects that I've labeled as anti-Clinton Republicans, actually there's really, they're all to the far right, and these actually are Republicans it seems. And yet the anti-Trump Democrats in my sample, their ideal points are across the spectrum and there's a bimodal distribution here. So it seems like there are in fact some anti-Trump Democrats, but there's also a cluster here potentially of um, anti-Trump Republicans who I sent the message from a Democrat bot priming the Democrat identity. So these were misapplied treatments. And I, I, I see that I, uh, when I remove the mislabeled Democrats, the Democrats who are in this part, um, the results are still not significant because the N plummets, but the point estimates go in the expected direction and they become larger. So I think that we might have better, uh, you know, more robust results if I had correctly applied all of the treatments. So, but again, so there's the, a the trade-off here between doing this quickly and estimating people's ideal points in real time, which also is sort of computationally expensive in terms of API calls. So I would like to do this in real time in the future, but I was constrained by resources at this point. So it's because we're treating their network as a Judaism or NASA, but kind of accepting. Yes, that's right. And for me, it's mostly the first part, the getting the networks. It just takes a lot of API calls. Um, right. Okay, so... Um, just wrapping up here about what to be fined from this experiment. I saw that there were large and persistent treatment effects caused by a single message from a high-status co-partisan on the entire sample, as expected. I did not ex find the expected heterodox treatment effects based on subject ideology. 
Um, one potential reason is that this was a, a unique election, right? So in particular, the Democrat candidate here positioned herself explicitly as the candidate of civility. And so we had a message that I thought would work most on uh, Republicans about following the rules of civility, and yet civility here was almost a partisan issue in which the Democrats were explicitly calling for um, civil norms, and Republicans were, many of them, the Trump supporters at least, were explicitly saying that this is not important, you're policing our speech, and we want someone who will break these norms. And so I think that insofar as the actual language I was using was um, designed to appeal to these different moral foundations, um, I would not reject the, that, that, that theoretical motivation, um, although I certainly did not find any support for it. Classifier. So oh, the actual way over the line. The Democrats were barely over the line. Maybe that would explain why the Democrats don't feel like they need to moderate their behavior. Um, no, I did not. So I, I have the distributions, and I can show you. They're roughly the same for uh, Republicans and Democrats. One other thing uh, that was very interesting when I was looking at the responses to the bots. So how did they respond? And so for the the feelings treatment, the thing that says you shouldn't do this, you have to remember that our opponents are real people with real feelings. Um, I coded the responses as being conciliatory or not. Did people express, you know, oh, maybe I, I shouldn't have done that, I'm sorry. Um, so in response to the feelings treatment, about half of the Republicans were conciliatory. They said I shouldn't be doing this. And zero out of eight of the Democrats who responded said that they were sorry at all. And, and the modal reason was these people are Trump supporters. I don't care about their feelings. And so this is getting back to the connection between effective polarization and incivility. If you genuinely think your opponents are not worthy of respect, then incivility makes sense. And so that's the, the base cause for why there's so much incivility, and yet I do think it's possible to change behavior um, by, by having high status in partisans talk about norms. <clears throat> I, I also found, as expected, that both the moral treatments were more effective than the public treatment, although you know the p-value is 0.16, so maybe I didn't find that, depending on how you P values. I also, again, find evidence that anonymity moderates treatment effects and more anonymous people are less likely to change their behavior in response to the social sanctioning. Um, in terms of how I want to continue developing these kind of projects, I want to use this framework and I want to build it out. I want to scale it up. I want to automate things. I want to get networks to see if I can detect spillover effects, which I think would be the really the cool thing, but again, very computationally expensive. This is all in the service of understanding how people learn online. That's what I'm ultimately interested in. I don't think Twitter is going to last forever, um, but political communication online probably will. So I'm interested in specifically how the different technological affordances of different platforms affect how people use them. And I think uh, three of the most salient ones about Twitter are the anonymity, which I have shown plays a big role in how people communicate and, and change norms. The salience of partisan identity. So on Twitter, the amount of information you divulge about yourself and your account, it's quite shallow. And so something like a social identity becomes extremely salient if that's the only information you have about someone. On Facebook, you see where they went to school, you see pictures of their dogs. And so even if they're an ardent Republican, you at least have something humanizing. On Twitter, it's really just a picture of them as a, a Trump supporter. And thus, it's very easy to um, de-individuate them and be incivil. And again, there's also the fact that there's more or less algorithmic sorting on certain platforms. Twitter doesn't have any, essentially. Um, they're, they're, they're rolling out a lot more, but they, they have not done it for a very long time, and this affects how people communicate with strangers. I'm, I'm interested in this because if we think about the early days of the internet, there was a lot of enthusiasm for this is going to allow people to communicate with everybody in the world. It's gonna be fantastic for democracy, deliberation, learning, and uh, yet, we don't see that happening today. People are much, less pessim much more pessimistic about the impact of the internet on democracy, communication, and deliberation. And I, I think that this is very important um, for academics and researchers in general. To, so much of the research in this area focuses on technology or government censorship about, in terms of how speech online happens. But I think norms of communication are at least as important. And so if there are norms of incivility, we're going to see this kind of hateful, unproductive, polarizing speech, um, and yet we would not find that if norms were different, even holding technology and government the same. So again, we are in the context in which we have small, persistent groups who are pushing towards incivility. 
right? trolls, foreign and domestic, as we've seen. But I was also struck by the ardor of these ideologues, these people who are going online saying, I am doing good by being incivil to bad people. And so if there's a lot of these people, they're driving these norms towards incivility. But I think it's at least possible that the norms that I've shown, that in some contexts, we can, we can enforce different norms. And uh, that's, that's the overall goal of this project. Right. Underneath, you know, the, these uh, uh, these um, uh, Twitter handles are ability. I think that's the, the, the this is uh, just the case the, the the place where we'd find these people. Right. So there aren't that many of them overall. But in response to public very salient tweets from these folks, that that's where we'd find them. So then, what can you say about the identification of this? If beyond, let's assume we accept your results. And let's assume we understand that it's, it's contained within Twitter. What kind of, um, you know, what percentage of people are reading through replies? You know, how much should we be worried about this inside even Twitter as far as, as what the effect is for most people who are trying to learn basic stuff about, about politics? So with the, the, how much, I'm sorry, could you? Okay, so if, if most people are not, I assume, reading through replies or not, I actually, you know, like, what, do you have any idea of, like, how much of political conversation even on Twitter is affected by this I see. small persistent group of people in the reply section? So this is, a, this is a, a difficult problem. I think people have been trying to answer this empirically. I, the best thing I can do is appeal to the survey evidence that I presented at the beginning. So we see that two-thirds of people, when they communicate with someone from the other side, think they have less in common that the majority of people who talk online think it's incivil and not respectful. So in terms of people's reported lived experiences, they think it's a problem. In terms of actually estimating how many people are exposed to this, that's very difficult. But I, I, that's, that's the evidence that I have. Um, right, well, that's all I have for, so we've got a few minutes for questions. That's right. So, in fact, um, this, the, this paper is an R&R, and uh, he was a reviewer. He signed his review, so I know what he thinks about it. Um, but he, he was overall supportive. He did say, in particular, the CARE Foundation and how he interprets it in relating to Democrats in America, they specifically care about specific groups. So there are uh, groups that have been historically oppressed in America. And the way that care manifests itself for this specific group of people, the Democrats, is in care for these folks. And so that actually um, comports very well with the fact that the Democrats expressed not caring for Trump supporters. So I think that um, you know, with some modification, it's actually reasonably consistent. Um, I will say that the specific language I used, I did not actually validate ex ante. I would have liked to do some, some of this. I was just in a rush to do it before the election. So it's possible that there would have been better oper operationalizations to make it map better onto the theory. So I'm not going to say I'm trying to take down hate or anything. I, I, I think it's plausible. That's why I used it to motivate it. But I think in the future, to really learn more, I would like to, to validate the messages ex ante. You can think about the kind of in intervention you can do as a user of Twitter, and then you could also think about what kind of interventions, if you worked at Twitter, could Twitter could be doing. Mm -hmm. Did, could you comment on maybe what you think um, would, may or may not be effective if you had more control? Like right. That? So I will say that one thing I think would not be effective would be a bot army of bots doing this. I think okay. that if that were what Twitter were to do, that would you know, inflame people. There yeah, would be yeah. a, a reaction against it. So I, the goal of this is to tap into this extant desire among people to police their communities online. So just, a lot of people call out bad behavior, but I think they often do it in a way that's counterproductive. So in the first, if I were to say to, in the first experiment, you're a racist, the function of this is to say, you're in group bad, I'm in group good. And that's just not how norms are enforced online. So what I'm trying to do is understand these mechanisms so that people who are trying to police speech can do so in a more productive way. Um, I do think that Twitter could do a better job of making it harder to set up new accounts. 
making it harder to communicate with strangers if you have a brand new account, things like this. Because just, just the, the newness of so many of the accounts that I encountered was striking, and I think that's a, a, a relatively easy fix that they could do um, and without upsetting people too much. Yeah? So you talked about spillover effects and establishing norms in communities. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to actually study these spillover effects and you were designing an experiment, how, how big of a hammer would it take in terms of the strength of the message, or the number of people piling on, or, or is it even possible to, to like, see these spillover effects on Twitter? Or like, and if not, where would you expect to? Right. So I think that given the sampling frame I've used here, the network should be sufficiently sparse that I'm not going to be able to, I, I would be surprised even if I had all the networks if they were to show these spillover effects. So one approach would be to try to get a, a stronger individual treatment. Another approach would be to try to treat multiple people in the network. So I think that a, a, if I had more time and more resources, what I would do is get the networks ahead of time, get a, a pool of potential subjects, and then figure out who in the network to target. And then I could measure um, potential spillover effects. That, that's what I would do. Well, oh, potentially, so I, I think that actually I, I wouldn't want to find the trolls. So I, I think what I've shown here is if the trolls are anonymous, they actually are likely to not change their behavior. But there are many people who are not anonymous who are still being uncivil. And these are people who are probably in meaningful real-life networks. And so then I could find the relevant people and apply the treatments that way. Right. All right. Thank you.